video, we're going to review chapter four. Remember the parts of a solution. A solvent is a substance um, that does the dissolving. If it's an aqueous solution, water is a solvent. The solute is the substance that is getting dissolved, typically present in the smaller amount, though it doesn't have to be. So if we have something like NaClAq, Aq stands for aqueous, it means dissolved in water. The solute would be the NaCl. Um, the solvent would be water. Instead of writing NaCl, don't forget if you put an ionic compound that's soluble in water, it will break up into its constituent ions. It will not be found with the two ions together in a lattice anymore. Um, so we could say more accurately, Na plus and Cl minus are our solutes. Okay. Um, there's several general properties of solutions. In a solution, there are no components large enough to scatter visible light. So the solution will look clear or look transparent. It might have a color to it, but it should look clear. You should be able to see through it. If you cannot, it is not a solution. Uh, the components cannot be separated using filter paper. If I use a funnel with filter paper through uh, in it and I pour a solution through that filter paper, nothing would be left behind. The entire solution would go through. So something like salt water, if I pour it through filter paper, Paper, nothing would get separated. Um, the salt and water together would go through the filter paper. I'd have to use some other means of separating, um, some other physical process that is going to utilize the differences in intermolecular forces or IMFs um, between the substances. So I can separate them based on boiling point. Um, a fancy word for that would be distillation, separation based on different boiling points. So let's say I had alcohol and water, um, ethanol or something with water, and the alcohol uh, boils at 80 degrees, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. If I heated that mixture, once I hit about 80 degrees, the ethanol or the alcohol would boil off and the water would be left behind, and that's one way I could separate it. Um, another way of separating would be chromatography, and that is when your two substances have different attractions to a solvent. Types of solution, saturated solution holds the maximum possible. If you add any more solute, it will fall to the bottom because no more can be dissolved in the solution. Unsaturated would hold less than the maximum. Supersaturated would hold more than the maximum, which might sound weird if that's possible, um, but most solids are um, more soluble in water at higher temperatures, though not all of them. So if you raise the temperature of the water, then dissolve the solute, and then cool it back down, um, you can actually get the situation where it holds the additional solute that it wouldn't normally hold at that lower temperature. But any more solute that's added would make the rest of it fall out. That shouldn't have been there. Um, so if I tell you 100 milliliters of water can hold 36 grams of NaCl, if I were to dissolve 30 grams of NaCl, it would all dissolve and form a sa an unsaturated solution. You have less than the maximum. If I were to try to dissolve 40 grams, only 36 grams of it would dissolve and form a saturated solution. That's the maximum possible. And the four additional grams of NaCl would remain undissolved at the bottom. If you see a solution that has undissolved solid at the bottom, you could assume it must be a saturated solution. If you're not sure what kind of solution you have, try adding some solute. If it dissolves, then that solution was unsaturated. If it falls to the bottom, then it was a saturated solution. If it not only falls to the bottom, but it causes additional crystals to form or additional solute to fall out of the solution, then it is, was a super saturated solution. Which of these definitely shows a saturated solution? This first one, because I have undissolved solid at the bottom. Okay, this could be saturated or unsaturated. I would have to add some more solute and see what happens if it dissolves. Unsaturated if it falls to the bottom, saturated. Anytime you have a saturated solution with undissolved solid at the bottom, um, you actually have this dynamic equilibrium situation where some of that solid is actively um, dissolving and forming ions, and some of the ions are coming back out of solution into the solid. And this is happening at the same rate. The rate of dissolving is equal to the rate of crystallizing. Um, when you have an ionic compound that is soluble, a good fact to know is that they break up into their constituent ions in water. So something like lithium bromide, when you're forming the aqueous solution, you can actually write it like this. It breaks up into Li plus and Br minus. If I have uh, magnesium bromide and I put that in water, it breaks up into Mg2 plus and two bromide ions. I put the two in front now because it's not found as diatomic bromine in the water. It's for, found as, for every one of these, two bromide ions. 
When you put an ionic compound in water, as we had said, it's going to dissociate or break apart into its constituent ions. So the waters will pull the ionic solid apart, and the ions will now be hydrated, surrounded by waters. The negative ion would be surrounded by waters with the hydrogen oriented toward it because the hydrogen is the partially positive part of the water, and opposites attract. The positive ion would be or would have waters oriented toward it with the oxygen side because that's a slightly negative side of the water. Remember, electricity is moving charges. So if you have a substance that has either mobile ions in it or mobile electrons, it could carry these moving charges through the substance and conduct electricity. The more ions you have, or the more electrons you have, the better the conductor. Electrolytes are substances that when you put them in water, when they, they will dissolve and produce ions, and thus they will conduct electricity when dissolved in water. So ionic compounds, acids, and bases all produce ions when dissolved in water, so they are all electrolytes. Other things might dissolve in water, um, but do not produce ions, and they would be called non-electrolytes. So anything molecular would be a non-electrolyte. And it could be polar and still dissolve in water, but it does not produce ions, so it is a non-electrolyte. Electrolytes can be strong or weak. Strong electrolytes 100% ionized. All of them are present fully as ions, so they are very good conductors. If it does not 100% ionize, then it would be a weak electrolyte, and weak electrolytes usually a lot less than 100% ionizes. A small fraction only ionizes, and most of it is present in the molecule form. These are weak conductors because there are fewer ions. We show the ionization of a strong electrolyte with one arrow pointing to the right, so in this situation HCl is a strong electrolyte. Um, I wouldn't find any HCl molecule together, I would find it all as H plus and Cl minus in the solution. All 100% is ionized. A weak electrolyte, I have double arrows to indicate it's an equilibrium situation. I have both um, the molecule form and the ion form present, but usually a lot more of the molecule form present than the ion form. Okay, so be able to pick out a particle diagram. This would be the strong electrolyte because it's 100% all found as ions. This would be a weak electrolyte because there are both molecules and ions present. And this would be a non-electrolyte. There are no ions present. There are three types of strong electrolytes. Soluble salts or soluble ionic compounds. Ionic compound is a salt. Um, strong acids and strong bases. Make sure you memorize your strong acids. Nitric, sulfuric, perchloric, OMI, HCl, HBr, and HI. Make sure you memorize your strong bases. Group 1 hydroxides and cabasser, meaning these group 1 and cabasser, um, when joined with OH, would be strong bases. And make sure you know your solubility rules. Sodium, potassium, essentially all group 1, ammonium, and nitrate salts are soluble. Anything else would be able to be gleaned from the problem statement. You might also see KSP values. If you have a small KSP, it's insoluble. A large KSP, soluble. Okay, dilute is just given the word or term given to something that has a low molarity or not very concentrated, doesn't have a lot of solute in that given solvent, and concentrated would be something that has a high molarity, something that has a lot of solute per, sol per solution. Molarity is on your formula sheet, it's moles of solute over liters of entire solution. If you see something in square brackets that indicates molarity, it is a way of measuring concentration. Um, so if you have grams of something, make sure you mold it out. 25 grams of zinc chloride is enough to form 400 milliliters of solution. Okay, so all I'm doing is I'm molding out my solute. I have lead milliliters, turn that into liters by dividing by a thousand or moving the decimal place over three places. And then I can divide these things to find the concentration of CNCl2 in molarity. I can either write moles over liters or capital M for molarity. Instead of asking for the molarity of this entire compound, I could ask you for the molarity of just the chloride ions. And then you can use the subscripts um, as conversion factors essentially. So. In 1ZnCl2, there are two chloride ions because it has a subscript of two. So I would just multiply my molarity by two, and I'd have double the amount of chloride ions. So you can isolate the molarity of a particular ion by using the subscript as a conversion factor, as I showed here, like with dimensional analysis, or essentially just multiplying by the subscript. Don't separate um, polyatomic ions. So if this was zinc, um, Chlorate, ClO3, um, within, would have a subscript of two outside of parentheses. Um, don't separate that into chlorine and oxygen. Make sure you keep the polyatomic ions together because that wouldn't separate. 
Okay, how can you prepare a solution? Um, one way is to prepare it from a solid, and if you see the term standard solution, that's just a solution you know the concentration of. So what you would do is you would weigh out your solid. Remember, we're weighing out, we need to know the mass of it. Um, you would use typically a volumetric flask because it's very accurate, it has a lot of significant figures anytime you see volumetric in, in front. Um, and then what you do is you would put that in the volumetric flask, you put a little bit of water in it, you dissolve it first, uh, make sure it fully dissolves before adding water all the way up to the line line on the flask because sometimes when you dissolve something it takes up a little bit more volume. It really depends on the intermolecular forces going on. Um, and then you could cap it with a stopper and invert it a few times to really mix it up. Okay, so here's a question. How many grams of NaCl are required to make 0.5 liters of 2 molar NaCl? Explain how to do it in the lab. So I've got to figure out um, if I have this volume and molarity, I can figure out how many grams of Na moles of NaCl I need. Um, here I'm just using the molarity as a conversion factor. Molarity is moles over liters, so I can use that to convert the uh, liters into moles. And I can turn the moles into grams, and I see I have to weigh out 58.5 grams of NaCl in this lab. So how can I make this? Okay, I'll weigh out the 58.5 grams of NaCl, and then I'll add that to a volumetric flask. And then I'll just add enough distilled water till I get to 500 milliliters total because that's what I would need in this situation. Really simple. Another way of preparing a solution is to use what's called a stock solution. A lot of times in the back of the lab we have solutions that are already made and they have high concentrations and we can dilute it down to the concentration we need. So dilution is the process of adding more solvent, which is typically water. So you would measure out... Um, some volume of this stock solution into a volumetric glass, let's say, and then you add more water to dilute it down to the lower concentration that you need. So the stock solution has the higher molarity, the solution that you're creating would have the lower molarity because it's water, you're diluting it down. When you're doing this, does the moles of solute change? So um, no, whatever moles you take out of this stock solution are going to stay in the beaker, and I can figure it out. Here's a volume, here's my molarity. Um, I would have 0.015 moles of nickel chloride solution here um, of nickel chloride and that would stay in my beaker. Does the volume change? Yes. It, you're not going to have five milliliters anymore. Now I have 500 milliliters so I'm adding more water to it. Does the molarity change? Yes because I'm diluting it. What is it now? Well, I have those same moles and I'm dividing it by this new volume, 0.5, and I get 0 0.030 molarity. So notice that it's a lot um, more dilute now. A lot of the times when you're preparing solutions though, um, you know the volume and the molarity you want and you have the molarity of the stock solution, but you need to figure out what volume of the stock solution to use. So a lot of the times that's what you're going to be solving for. So there's kind of this shortcut equation you can use for dilution since the molarity changes but the moles of solute aren't changed. You could say the moles before dilution are equal to the moles after dilution or M1V1 equals M2V2 where the ones represent before the dilution, the concentrated, the twos represent after. Sometimes you see this as MCVC equals MDVD for C's for concentrated, D's for dilute. So this would be like the question you would be kind of asking yourself in a lab. Well, how many milliliters of a concentrated solution would I need to make 100 milliliters of this more diluted concentration that I know I need for this next procedure, let's say. Lift, list the steps of how to do this. So I need to figure out what volume of the H2SO4 of, of this 5 molar I need. So I'm just plugging into this equation and I'm solving for the V1. Okay, this is the solution I want to make, 100 milliliters of 0.1 molar, 5 molar is what I'm starting with. What volume do I need to take uh, of this first molarity? 2 milliliters. Okay, well, how am I going to do this in the lab? Well, first of all, if this is an acid, you need to remember safety rules. You've always got to add the acid um, to the water. So you've got to measure out your water first. So if I need 100 milliliters of this final solution and I need to get 2 milliliters of it of this H2SO, this starting H2SO4, then I know that I'm going to have to add 98 milliliters of water. So my procedure would be always wear safety gear, especially if you're handling an acid. Measure out the distilled water, probably using a graduated cylinder. 
okay, I measure out 98 milliliters of distilled water and transfer that to the, your volumetric flask that you're preparing your solution in. And then measure out the acid since it's a, a, a lesser amount of the acid, maybe use a volumetric pipette. All the, anything that has volumetric in front is really going to have a large number of sig figs. Um, and then you'd want to add your acid to the water to that 98 milliliters of water. If it's not an acid, then it doesn't matter the order of things that you add. If it's not an acid, if this were something completely different, um, then I could just say, okay, take a volumetric pipette, take out two milliliters of this five molar solution, add it to a volumetric um, a volumetric flask, and then add enough distilled water to get to 100 milliliters. Then you can do that. But if it's an acid, you've got to add the acid to the water. You've got to measure out the water first. Just remember, whenever you're pouring out a smaller sample from a larger one, so this is a 1,000 milliliter flask containing 6 mol, uh, molar copper sulfate, um, let's say I pour it into a 100 milliliter graduated cylinder, obviously the volume's no longer the same. Is the molarity the same? Yes. When you These two things would both have the same molarity, so if this is 6 molar, this would be 6 molar. Would the moles be the same? No, I obviously are going to have less moles. So the ratio of moles over volume is the same. I have less volume so I'd have less moles. Um, so anytime you have volume and molarity, remember you have um, moles. So in the flask, I'd have six moles. In the um, cylinder, I'd have 0.6 moles. So when taking a smaller sample, the molarity is the same, but the moles are not. So in this problem, 360 milligrams of aspirin um, is dissolved in enough water to produce 200 milliliters of solution. Then they want to know what's the molarity of aspirin in a 50 milliliter sample of the solution. Um, well, I have the grams of aspirin. I can mole it out, essentially, to get the moles of my solute. And then I can divide it by the volume that it's dissolved in, which is the 200 milliliters and get the molarity and if I were to take a 50 milliliter sample of that the molarity would be the same the moles would not be the same but the molarity would be sometimes you might have a problem where there's a mixing without a reaction so if I take these two containers and pour them into my um, into another beaker and I want to know what's the molarity in that new beaker um, so remember that if you're doing this and how do I know if it's without a reaction usually it might be the same substance or they might have a common ion instead of like HCl and HCl like KCl and HCl or something um, something like that so um, the new volume would be additive you would add the volumes together 150 and 100 milliliters the moles um, would be additive because I'm not changing the total amount of moles I'm just adding them together so I can mole out each of my starting containers first, and then I can mole add those moles together. And then the molarity would be something I would calculate with my new moles over my new total volume, and I'd get the molarity. So the molarities are not additive, but the moles and the volumes are, and then I can calculate the new molarity. Okay, so here's 70 milliliters of 3 molar sodium carbonate is added to 30 milliliters of 1 molar sodium bicarbonate. What is the result in concentration of Na plus? So I could essentially mole out each of these to get my initial Na pluses in each beaker, and then I can add them together and add the volumes together and then get my new molarity. So from the Na2CO3, okay, here's my volume and my molarity. Here's my moles of sodium carbonate, but there's two Na's in every one of these, so I'd have doubled the amount of moles by multiplying by the subscript. And from the NH, um, NaHCO3, the sodium bicarbonate, I'd have 0.03 moles of the sodium bicarbonate, and there's only one Na, so it's the same amount of moles of Na+. I could add those together, so my total moles and my new resulting solution would be 0.45 and my total volume would be 70 plus 30 or 100 milliliters or 0.1 liters and I could divide the moles by liters and I get 4.5 molar.